stuff that rejoice when they have a, a big sale going on, Black Friday and all that. I don't like Black, Black Friday. I like a Good Friday, Merry Christmas Friday, don't you? But you know, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin. He came out of heaven just for me. And what a present I received years ago when I was saved, about 43 years ago now. And I thank God for that. But he came down. That's what this song says. What grace is this? Right before the preaching of the word. Out from heaven's palaces, splendor filled and bright, came the King, and He came to bring to this world new life and light. What grace is this that brought my Savior down, that made Him leave His glorious throne and crown? The one who made the earth, the sky, and sea, who put the stars in every galaxy. What condescension, oh, how can it be? What shame he suffered, oh, what agony. And then the death he died, for sinners crucified. What grace is this? What grace is this? Oh, the boundless grace of God seen in Christ the Lord, greater than all the sin of man, and it's freely now outpoured. What grace is this that brought my Savior down, that made him leave his glorious throne and crown? The one who made the earth, the sky, and sea, who put the stars in every galaxy. What condescension, oh, how can it be? What shame he suffered, oh, what agony. And then the death he died, for sinners crucified. What grace is this? What grace is this? All right, open your Bible this morning, please, to the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, please. Isaiah, chapter 9. Just have one verse to read to you. The message I prepared this morning, to be honest with you, I had it prepared a couple of weeks ago, and I wanted to preach it then, but God just didn't let me, so I saved it for today. And uh, think about this. This is the last Sunday before Christmas Day. I hope all your shopping is done. Not very many amens there. I hope all your stockings are hung by the chimney with care and all that. I hope you can just enjoy the next few days. How many of you have tomorrow off work? I'll raise my hand. All right. Brother Gerald, you got every day off work. You're retired, aren't you? <laughs> All right. Well, you get some time off work. Hope you can just enjoy the time this week and uh, re realize what Christmas is all about. I thought about this. Christmas is a time you don't get to see folks, or you get to see some folks you don't get to see for a long time. Like we got to see my family the other day. I don't get to see them, but just a few times a year. I know Miss Julie's got her family here today, and what a blessing that is. But it's a time for that. It's a time to see folks you don't get to see some. It's time to eat things you don't get to eat all year long. Can you imagine eating all year like I've been eating the last couple of weeks? Goodness gracious. Uh, but I'm enjoying the time, and I hope you are too. I look forward to next week and all it means to us. But if it had not been for Jesus, we'd have nothing to celebrate. We'd just be wandering around hopelessly, aimlessly, with no cause, no hope, no direction, and no peace, and no, and no, eternal, uh, and no eternal home of heaven when we die. Just imagine that. Imagine what we wouldn't have if it wasn't for Jesus Christ. I want you to see now in Isaiah chapter 9, verse number 6. If you, have a, if you have a Schofield Bible, right above verse number 1 is a little saying, and the saying is this, under chapter 9 of Isaiah, a divine child, Israel's only hope. Only hope. 
Look in Isaiah verse, chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And I want to focus for the next few moments on this subject, the Prince of Peace. All of the names that Jesus gives himself here, I like the Prince of Peace. Because only Jesus can give peace. Only Jesus can calm the weary soul. Only Jesus, by the way, can save the lost soul. He's the Prince of Peace. And I want to preach on that subject this morning, the Prince of Peace. Let's pray. Father, what a good day it's been already to be in your house. The music has been a blessing. Just the spirit that's in here this morning has been a blessing. And I pray right now as we have our Bibles open... God, that you may let us see what we need to see from this text this morning as we look through it now, this great verse. I pray, God, you would speak to us now and show us and help us and draw us close to thee. I thank you, God, that you are the Prince of Peace. I thank you, Lord, that uh, whatever's going on in our life, good or bad, we can all have peace because you are the Prince of Peace. And we thank you so much for that. And I pray today, God, maybe someone here who's not saved, someone who's not sure of a home in heaven, someone who doesn't have that peace that you want us all to have. So I pray for them this morning that you may bless and help and speak to their hearts as well. But God, you use the preaching of thy word to glorify your name, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> Only one verse today, but my, what a verse. So much stuff packed in this one verse. And I want you to think about all the truths of Christmas can be found right here in this one verse, uh, Isaiah 9, uh, chapter 6. I mentioned this just a minute ago, but, uh, but Isaiah looked forward. He spoke this prophecy 700 years before it happened, but I believe Isaiah thought it was as true as if it was going to happen tomorrow. As a matter of fact, I think he believed it was as true as it already happened. Now see, we can look back on the birth of Jesus Christ. We can look back 2,000 years ago and realize all the things he is. We can look back and say, he's wonderful, he's counselor, he's mighty God, he's everlasting father, he's prince of peace, but Isaiah is looking forward to that time when the Messiah was going to come and he He's going to be wonderful. He's going to be counselor. He's going to be mighty God. He's going to be everlasting father. He's going to be prince of peace. But we can look back on that and realize what a great blessing that is. Think about this. Isaiah was looking forward to the day when, the, when God the Father would take on human flesh and be born and placed in a manger and going to die for the sins of the entire world. He looked forward to that. But we can look back on it. And realize he's wonderful, he's counselor, he's mighty God, he's everlasting father, and he's prince of peace. Let me, let me this morning give you quick, quickly, uh, I say quickly, five things from this verse that I hope this morning will be a help to us. Think about, first of all, this prince of peace. Think about this. Think about his salvation. His salvation. Verse 6 says this, For unto us a child is born. Listen, you can, if you're saved today, you can put your name there. For unto me... A child is born. Unto Matt Grimes. Jesus Christ was born for Matt Grimes. And you put your name there. Bible says, for unto us a child is born. The Lord came to earth in the form of a baby. And that's sometimes so hard to realize. Why wouldn't he come in the form of a mighty king? Why wouldn't he come in the form of just a mighty soldier? He was all those things, but he came to earth in the form of a baby. He came to ransom the lost from condemnation. He didn't come to earth on a reconnaissance mission. He didn't come to earth just to be able to send back word to the Father what was going on down here. Not at all, folks. He didn't come to turn bad people into good people. He came for one mission, and it was to offer salvation for all who believe in Him. Listen, His purpose and His plan from the beginning of time was to come and to provide a way of salvation so every man and every woman and every boy and every girl might be saved. Remember what the angel told Joseph in Matthew 1.21, and, and, and she shall bring forth the Son, and thou shalt call His name Jesus, for He shall save His people from their sins. He came for you. He came for me. He came for this wonderful Bible word, whosoever. Now, there are some uh, religions that don't believe in that whosoever. But I'm going the Bible tells us, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Why is that possible? Because Jesus Christ offers, in his coming, offers salvation to all who believe. Think about that. 
He came down. He, he became flesh. He decided to live among sinful people on a sinful earth so he might reconcile us all back to God. He's the Prince of Peace because of his salvation. Number two, think about his submission. Uh, for unto us, look what the Bible says, a child is born. I'm afraid that many times we look over the fact that a child was born. Uh, that reminds us, yes, he was human, but he's also God all at the same time. I don't understand that. I can't explain that to you, and you can't explain that to me, how somebody could be born both God and baby at the same time. It's not understandable in our own minds. That's why it's all by faith. But the Bible says this. We know with surety that God the Father took on the flesh, human flesh, and came to dwell among us. We're talking about something that can only happen supernaturally. The birth of Jesus Christ is different than any other birth that has ever happened or ever will happen. Because we're talking about this, the Son of God. We're talking about the second person in the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Talking about Him laying, down, laying aside the glory that only He possessed and taking on human flesh and dwelling among sinful mankind as a little baby. Think about this, Jesus Christ, God the Father, Jesus sent His Son, Jesus Christ, uh, and, and God humbled Himself. Jesus humbled Himself to be born of a virgin and be laid in a manger and to dwell upon earth, live amongst sinful men. Why would He do that? Knowing he'd never have a place to call his own. Knowing what his lot was going to be. Knowing folks were going to misunderstand him and reject him. Knowing that folks would eventually crucify him for the sins of the world. But still, the Bible says, unto us a child is born. Amen. Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen to him. And he knew that they were going to mock him and reject him and, and, uh, and, and spit upon him and scourge him and pluck out his beard and ignore him and make fun of him. He knew they were going to reject him. Listen, he knew they were going to crucify him. But we notice his submission. He submitted to the needs of the people to be saved because he submitted to the will of his Father. I don't know about you, but I am very humbled by the fact that, that God would leave the glory and splendor of heaven, to, could leave all that which we look forward to. We look forward to the streets of gold. We look forward to fishing in the river of life, if that's going to happen. We look forward to the marriage supper of the Lamb. We look forward to forever having fellowship with God the Father forever and ever and ever. But Jesus left all that to come down here for 33 and a half years. It's not that he had to live on earth. It's that he wanted to live on earth so that he could die for our sins and provide a sacrifice for our sins. He's the Prince of Peace because of his salvation, because of his submission, and also, number three, because of his sacrifice. For unto us a child is born. And the Bible goes on to say, unto us a son is given. It's interesting, the Bible says that a son is given. Listen, not only was a son given, but the Son of God was given. God the Father gave us His only begotten Son, and uh, the reason that God the Father gave us His only begotten Son is so He could make a sacrifice for our sins. Think about this. Christ didn't come to earth just to heal the sick, but He did heal the sick. He didn't come to earth just to raise the dead, but he did raise the dead. He didn't come to earth just to give counsel to the wayward, but he did give counsel to the wayward. He didn't come to earth just to do miracles, but he did do miracles. He came to earth to offer himself a sacrifice and the final sacrifice for the sins of all the people. By the way, if you're saved today, it's because Jesus Christ made the sacrifice for your sin. You couldn't sacrifice your own life. You couldn't give your own blood. You couldn't make atonement for yourself. Somebody had to die for you, and praise be unto God, it was Jesus. But before he could do all that, he had to come to here. His sacrifice. The Bible says he humbled himself and became obedient to the death of the cross. Because don't forget, a price had to be paid. You and I can't go to heaven because of our own merit. 
There's none of us good enough, none of us holy enough, none of us righteous enough. And so a price had to be paid. Jesus Christ made the sacrifice. He paid the price. While you and I couldn't, he could, and he did. By the way, I'm glad that God gave his only begotten son to be a sacrifice for me. The only sacrifice that could be made. By the way, the only sacrifice God would accept was the sacrifice of his son. Think about his sacrifice. The cross was no accident. It wasn't just plan B when God the Father saw that the Ten Commandments didn't work. He wouldn't say, well, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? People are going to die and go to hell. They can't keep the commandments. What's going to happen? What am I going to do? Somebody help me. What am I going to do? No, the plan from the beginning of the time was for Jesus Christ to come and die and shed his blood and pay the price. It was no accident. It wasn't plan B. It wasn't the devil's plan to get Jesus off the earth. Not at all, folks. From the moment Christ was born in Bethlehem, he knew what was going to happen. He knew he was going to give his life. As he laid in the manger, he knew what was going to happen. As the shepherds came to see him, he knew all about it. As the wise men came to worship him and give those gifts unto him, he knew what was going to happen. And as Herod tried to kill him, the baby Jesus knew what his fate was going to be. He was well aware of the God the Father's plan to sacrifice his own son. I'm glad the Bible tells us that for unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. We notice his salvation. We notice his submission and his sacrifice. Number four, we notice his sovereignty. And the Bible says about this baby Jesus, this child, this son, the Bible says this in verse number six, for unto us a child is born, and to us a son is given, listen to this, and the government shall be on his shoulder. Hmm. I can imagine the Jews were awful confused by this because, you see, they were, the Jews, they were indeed looking for a king to come. They were looking for a Messiah to come. They were looking for somebody to come and to deliver them from Roman bondage. They were looking for somebody who would come and be their king. They were looking for somebody who would come and the government would be upon their shoulders, but they didn't think it was going to be a baby. They thought that some Messiah, some king was going to come on a white horse. They thought maybe some king was going to come with a mighty entourage. But no, he came as a little baby. So they must have been confused. Isaiah told them 700 years before it was going to happen that a child was going to be born and that a son was going to be given. And now he's telling them that this baby, this child, this son is going to rule over them. Does that mean this little baby is going to be the king? Oh yeah. oh, yeah, that's right. Not only was he going to be the king, but like the wise men said, he was born king. Uh, he's king of kings, and he was going to come and rule and reign over his people. Think about this. Even though he's only a child, he's their king. Even though he's only going to be a, a child, he's going to be in charge. Even though he's going to be a child, the government shall be upon his shoulders. And can I say this? The government is still on his shoulders. He's in charge of everything that's ever going to happen. I don't want to get political, but it doesn't matter who's in the White House. The government's on Jesus' shoulders. It doesn't matter who's in charge at the Kremlin. Is there still a Kremlin, Brother Roger? Okay, whoever's there in charge of Russia, the government's uh, on, on the shoulders of Jesus. No matter who's in charge of the United Nations, can I say to you that the government is still on the shoulders of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter who's elected or who's appointed or who schemes their way into office by, with a bunch of lies and a bunch of, uh, of, of nonsense. Listen, the government is still on the shoulders of Jesus Christ. And like it or not, it's the way it's always going to be. Look in verse 6. And the government shall be on his shoulder. He's going to rule and reign not only in their lifetime, but he's going to rule and reign forever. Because Philippians 2 says this, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, being Jesus, and given him, Jesus, a name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, of things on earth, of things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Can I remind you what I told you a couple weeks ago? He was born king, and he's still king. The government's on his shoulders. And don't you know the Jews... We're not very happy to hear this. 
Because their idea of a king and their idea of Messiah, oh, he'd have a crown on his head and he'd, have, he'd be coming with a, with a mighty entourage and maybe with soldiers walking alongside him as he came to Jerusalem. They didn't know it was going to be a baby. His sovereignty. Notice his supremacy. <clears throat> and his name, this, this child... This child that's born, this son that's given, this one in which the government should be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. There's something very amazing about this child that's born, something very amazing about this son that's given, because he's not only a child, he's a supreme child. Not only is he a, the son, he's the supreme son. He's greater than any child ever born. He's greater than any son ever given. He's the most important child, most important person ever born, who will ever be born. And Isaiah, notice how he describes, notice the words he uses to describe this child and this son and this, and this, uh, and this one whose government's on his shoulders. Think about what he uses, the words he uses. Number one, he uses the word wonderful. The word wonderful has the idea of being supernatural and extraordinary. Amen. Without a doubt, there's nothing ordinary about the Lord. He's extraordinary. There's nothing natural about the Lord. He's supernatural. Uh, this child and this son has done for us what nobody else could do. He's reconciled us back to God. He's redeemed us. He's regenerated us. And He's promised us eternal life. By the way, he gives us a wonderful life. Any of you guys watched that movie the other night on Channel 6, NBC? Man, what a, I watched most of it. Uh, I love that movie. Uh, but listen, to the Christian, it's not just a movie. It can be a fact. Uh, because we have a Savior, we can have a wonderful life. Think about this. He's given us a wonderful family. He's given us a wonderful church. He's given us a wonderful salvation. And he's promised us a wonderful place called heaven when we die. Although Isaiah made this prophecy 700 years before it was going to happen, he hit the nail on the head. He's wonderful. He's also counselor. The word counselor literally means one who gives advice or help or gives direction. Isn't that interesting? Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm glad Jesus is the one giving the directions in my life because I tell you what, I wouldn't know which way's up without him. Uh, I'm glad he didn't save me and say, okay, Matt, I've saved you. Have a good life. I'll see you when you die. No, not at all, folks. He died for us. He lives with us. He guides us. He leads us. We got somebody who's greater than, than us inside of us, somebody smarter than us, somebody who knows all that there is to know living inside of us. He's our counselor. He's wonderful. Think about this. I'm glad he's got a plan for me. I'm glad he's got a plan for you. Isaiah, I mean, Psalm 37, 23 says this, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. How is that possible? Because he's our counselor. Amen. And again, although Isaiah made this prophecy 700 years before it was going to happen, again, he got it exactly right. He's our counselor. He's also our mighty God. The phrase mighty God speaks of a strong one the conqueror, the invisible one. Think about this. During Christmas time, uh, we think of Jesus as being a baby. Oh, but he was more than a baby. He is the mighty God. Even as a baby, he was the strong one and the conqueror and the invincible one. Listen, and since he's the mighty God, I don't know about you, but I'm just going to let him have control of my life. Uh, we don't live our life by luck or circumstance. We don't live our life just wondering what's going to happen. Not at all, folks. We have a, a mighty God. He's guiding us. He's guarding us. He's taking care of us. And to the Christian, there's nothing to fear because we have a mighty God. He's the one who put the stars in their place, the Bible says. He's the one who formed the mountains and he carved out the oceans. He's the one who took dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Think about this. He was mighty at creation and he's still mighty. Amen. He was mighty at the Red Sea and he's still mighty. He was mighty on Mount Carmel and he's still mighty. He was mighty against Goliath and he's still mighty. He was mighty for the prophets, and he's mighty for us. He was mighty at the tomb of Lazarus, and he's still mighty today. He was, he is, and he'll forever be the mighty God. 
And even though Isaiah spoke those words 700 years ago, he's right on target. He's the mighty God. He's also the everlasting Father. Think about this. The God that we serve, you know, all these songs we've been singing today, all this worship we've been giving God today, our God's got no beginning. You say, was there ever a time when God wasn't? No. Will there ever be a time when there's not a God? No. He's the everlasting Father. He calls himself the Alpha, which means the beginning. He calls himself the Omega, which means uh, the ending. He is, he, he was, and the Bible says he is to come. Think about this. There has never been a time when God wasn't. I hope that's the right verb tense. There's never been a time where God wasn't. Uh, Muhammad hasn't been around forever. Uh, Buddha hasn't been around forever. Uh, Mary hasn't been around forever. But Jehovah God, the everlasting Father, He's just that. He's everlasting. And I want you to think about this. Muhammad and Buddha and Mary and all those folks, they're around no longer. But our everlasting Father is still around. He's still alive. He'll be alive forevermore. God isn't a here today God and a gone tomorrow God. He's not only here when we need Him, God. He's the everlasting Father. And again, even though Isaiah made this prophecy 700 years ago, good job, Isaiah, right on the target. Think about this and I'll be done. He calls himself the Prince of Peace. It's kind of interesting to me because... How can you be a king and a prince at the same time? Usually, a descendant of the king is the prince. But here we find this little baby. He's the king and the prince at the same time. But what kind of prince? The prince of peace. Jesus is the king of kings. He's the prince of peace all at the same time. No matter, how, no matter how impossible that seems with our, with our mortal mind, no matter how impossible that seems to be, with our, with our finite mind, can I say, with God, all things are possible. He's the Prince of Peace because He's the only one who can give real peace. I'm talking about real peace. The world's peace is false. It's temporary. But God's peace is real peace. It's eternal peace. Think about this. He gave peace to Mary when he told her that she was going to have a baby. He gave peace to Joseph when the angel told him that his soon-to-be wife was going to have a baby and it wasn't his. He gave peace to the wise men as they came to see him. He gave peace to the shepherds as they came to see him. He gave peace to Simeon as Simeon finally got to see him. He gave peace to Anna as she served him in the temple. He gave peace to the disciples while they're on the storm on the sea. He gave peace to Martha and Mary as their brother Lazarus was dead. He gave peace to those who came to him for healing. He gave peace to those who had no peace because that's just what the Prince of Peace does. Just walking around living his life, giving out peace. So thank God that while he came to earth as a baby, he's still the Prince of Peace. And again, Isaiah made this prophecy 700 years before it was going to happen. And it happened exactly the way, the exact time, the exact way, the exact place it was said it was going to happen. So let me close with this. This coming Wednesday, I hope you're with your family and I hope you're gathered around a, a Christmas tree, and I hope you've got bukus of presents. Is that bukus over y'all's head? That means a lot. Georgia talk, that means a lot. Tennessee talk, it's bukus. A lot. But as you celebrate, and as you open up those gifts, think about this. He's wonderful. He's counselor. He's mighty God. He's the everlasting Father. And He's the Prince of Peace. Please stand, we'll pray. Every head bowed, every eye closed for just a, just a minute. Amen. <clears throat>